All right. Hello and welcome. Uh, we're really pleased to have a, a Christian book here to read. Um, I'm Nick Monfort. I uh, direct the Trope Tank, and uh, we have a series, Purple Blurb, uh, of events sometimes much more modest than this, but uh, um, full of uh, energy and enthusiasm and uh, exploration of uh, curious aspects of language, computing, and the like. Um, and um, uh, we think uh, um, comparative media studies and writing for the support of this event. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to introduce Christian Book, author of Crystallography, Eunoia, and the book from which he'll be reading today, the Xenotext, book one. He won the Griffin Prize for Eunoia, and as an internationally renowned sound poet, he holds the world's record for the shortest recitation of Kurt Schwitter's for Sonata. You ask very nicely. Uh, uh, he, he, he might uh, supply this for you uh, uh, in the question and answer period. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> he uh, um, uh, does uh, develop artist books recently, several based on Jorge Luis Borges' Library of Babel. Um, and he's also worked constructing languages for television shows. Christian Book is remarkable for many reasons. His ability to connect art and science is certainly one of these. I think you'll see some of that in the project. Uh, see a good deal of that in the project that he's uh, reading from. Uh, but the one I wish to emphasize as we welcome him today is his determination and his ability to exert great effort over many years on projects, something that we certainly respect here at MIT. Um, in his Xenotext project of more than a decade, he exhibits this remarkable trait, and he set for himself the task of writing and inscribing a poem that would have a significant chance of outlasting our son. Uh, I invite you to imagine the audacious scenario that he's working to attain, one in which a highly resistant organism with a poetic text encoded in it genetically uh, would remain after other life on the planet had been extinguished uh, into the final phase of our son's existence. The sun that did wax for aeon and aeon, the big sun, the red sun, not too hot now, was set out for its end. The sun was one big red eye, and the eye did not cry for our orb, our dry orb. Not one man ran now, not cow, not cat, nor emu, nor ant. The orb was dry and had not one sea. The shy sun can let off hot gas now, the red eye can dim. The sun can fit its sky urn, can put out all but one dot. The red sun now can end. But the dry orb has air yet, one bit. The sun, yes, can now put out one erg. The orb, not yet ash, has DNA now. One bit, one bug, one far out jot. The DNA has not one ode, but two. One man did fit the two, era and era ago. Now the sun out, the DNA can sag. The bug can die. Sun but one dot, all but all out. The ode can end its run. The ode ran all the way. The ode and the sun ran, and the ode won. Christian Book Incendiary has set a truly extreme goal for himself in this current project. Looking beyond the clock of the long now, he's fixed his gaze on a star. And of all our literary artists, I cannot think of one more fit for the audacity of such a project. Uh, anyone else? would be as apt to challenge the sun. Christian Book. The late heavy bombardment Welcome, wraith and reader, to the Hadean aeon of the earth, when myrmidons hurled their cobalt bombs into your molten world of basalt and bronze, when mighty golems swanned from orbit to drive their glaives of iron into your black mesas, only to be engulfed by the blast waves, 
When meteors fell earthward in droves, each one a gigaton warhead ablaze. When supervolcanoes erupted, flammavomis after each hammer blow from these endless blitzes of aerolites and firebombs. When bolides of brimstone collided, then exploded into ablative cascades. When tsunamis of lava like napalm bedrived Drowned a subcontinent in a deluge of flames, when millions of Molotov cocktails shattered all at once upon the cobblestones of hell, when Trojans berserk with rage stormed over the brink of your abyss, vowing to claw your face from the skull of the moon. What dire seed must these onslaughts have scattered like shrapnel across your cremated badlands? What prion, what virus, what breed of spore must have emerged like a spear point or a sword blade from these early ovens of Auschwitz, each cyanide bonfire burning in reverse, spitting forth a fitful embryo cloned from the smoke and the dross? What orchid must have bloomed among the flamethrowers in the furnace? What dragon must have hatched from a burnt geode buried in these ashes? Must the universe be so pitiless as to immolate all its offspring at birth? Even now, the astronauts have marshaled their forces to march resolute across the kill zone of your god-forsaken crematorium. Even now, they forge ahead onward through war games of wildfire, unaware that far away a doomsayer murmurs prayers against them from a fiendish grimoire. What howl can beckon from the benthic fathoms of your damnation so alien a ghoul as Vampiro Tuthis Infernalis, the vampire squid from hell, a maw that can hurl itself at your soul like an overcloak cast upon a coat hook? In the dark, what does such a black brain afloat in its vat of ink know about the death blows to your planet? What does such an emissary think about the pageant of living things that go extinct en route to your incinerators? The trilobites, the nautilites, the gorgosaurs, the pterosaurs, the iguanodons, the megalodons, all of them massacred but unmourned. All the deepest seas have withered and soured. All the tallest alps have crumbled and burned. You have choked on miasmas of methane. You have upturned all your braziers, spilling embers across the flagstones. All your fossils have dissolved in a flash flood of acid rain. What great comet has yet to plummet from the heavens like a rocket engine dousing its jets during splashdown in your oceans of nitroglycerin? What thunderclap has yet to herald the advent of this plowshare which can bulldoze a mountain into rubble upon impact? What matchheads, when scraped against your atmosphere, can ignite its oxygen, turning the sky into a blazing typhoon. Only a demigod like 99942 Apophis can offer you this apocalypse by becoming the juggernaut that smashes through the massive bulwark of your bedrock. Only destroyers like 2102 Tantalus or 4179 Tutatis can erase all earthlings with the ease of suicide bombs at a marketplace. Can an oyster in its shell survive the inferno of free fall from outer space? Can a crocus thrive in soil made from pulverized meteorites? All hail, hail bop, and every super bomb yet to detonate.
What great dying must the earth foresee in the barren mirror of the moon? What fate, what fury, what muse must gaze upon the grim face of grief reflected in your silver shield, a faceplate of bulletproof glass, pitted and strewn with scars, what cinders of flame disintegrate in your gray seas of nectar, of vapor, of crisis, what shell shock must greet you when you stumble aghast upon the charred remains of a forest at Tunguska, its evergreens toppled and blasted, all of them split, like matchsticks, what crater among the lunar Maria must you yearn to recreate whenever you vaporize an atoll? Even now, your battalions of astronauts stride across green plains of Trinitite to storm the walls of Castle Bravo and Castle Romeo. Even now, Neil Armstrong returns like Orpheus to the airlock, his spacesuit reeking of gunpowder and burnt steel. What American falconer must aviate your spy plane by the stray light of meteor storms from the draconids or the scorpions, the flak raining down like glitter dust upon the desert during a nocturnal fire fight? What scythe blades must the Vikings forge from the wreckage of an asteroid recovered from Cape York? What archangel must the martyrs placate when they kiss the black stone of the Kaaba at Mecca during the Hajj? What sunburst must erupt like Krakatoa over the Arctic Circle when the firepower of your payload exceeds by tenfold all the dynamite exploded during World War II? Even now, the President of the United States sits alone at night, dreading the grim hour when he must open the memo from his aide, only to read upon the page the single phrase, pinnacle nuke flash, the news flash that chronicles the omnicide of the world. What global threat of Sturm und Drang must your armies yet endure, even in their granite bunkers deep beneath the massif of Cheyenne Mountain, when every fountain of hellfire in the firmament can destroy you, when a K-dwarf star like Gliese 710 can plow through the Oort cloud, bombarding the earth with cometoids that shatter every landmass, when a wolf riot star like WR-104 can outshine the galaxy in a burst of gamma rays so bright that the blaze must burn away the ozone layer, when the sun itself can bloat then flare to engulf you in a flaming embrace that atomizes the iron core of your planet. Even now, your astronauts are running out of air while they writhe inside their blazing coffins. Even now, you must despair, for you have listened to the throb of the universe, yet you do not hear the cries of any other souls in hell. Tell me, wraith and reader, tell me, will love save us from our fear that we are here alone? What then if we peer into the sky at night but see no distant lantern blinking at us from the far end of the cosmos? What if such a beacon goes unnoticed like a dying flame in the darkness? What if only the most wicked people in the world, the pharaohs, the warlocks, the assassins, ever get to read this signal from outer space? What if the message, when decoded, says nothing but a single phrase repeated? We despise you. We despise you. What if we find the evidence for such hate embedded in our genomes? Even now, colonies of dark ants 
from a species called Mystrium Shadow feed themselves upon the blood of their young. Even now, my love, these words confess to you that the universe, without you in it, is but a merciless explosion. Come with me and let me show you how to break my heart. That was the Michael Bay moment in the reading. Um, I'm reading uh, from the Xenotext, book one, a long-term project uh, that involves me enciphering a message into a strand of DNA and then implanting it into a bacterium, replacing part of its genetic code with my poem so that the organism becomes the living embodiment of my text. Moreover, I've written this poem in such a way that the organism can actually read it and interpret it as a set of instructions for building a protein in response, uh, a viable protein whose sequence of amino acids is itself an encipherment for yet another meaningful poem. So in effect, I've engineered uh, a bacterium so that it becomes not only an archive for storing my poem, it becomes a machine for writing a poem in response. Uh, the punchline to this crazy project is that uh, the selected host for this symbiote uh, is a extremophile bacterium called Dinococcus radiodurans, a bacterium capable of surviving in all kinds of hostile environments. Scorch it, wither it, freeze it, and it does not die. Uh, it can actually uh, survive in the open vacuum of outer space. It can repair its own DNA so quickly that it does not mutate or evolve very easily. Uh, it can even survive a thousand times the dosage of gamma radiation that might instantly obliterate a human being. Uh, we don't know what its natural habitat is, and some scientists have speculated that in order to have acquired all of these immunities, uh, its terrestrial ancestor may have had to spend at least part of its evolutionary history in outer space. By putting my poem into this organism, I'm hoping that I might be able to write a book that lasts uh, beyond uh, terrestrial civilization and may, in fact, uh, be on the planet Earth when the sun explodes. I'm effectively trying to write a book that lasts forever. Um, I'm going to read to you the two poems that I've enciphered into the organism. I don't often do this. They're not in the Xenotext book one. They'll be in the subsequent uh, volume. Uh, I've nicknamed these two poems Orpheus and Eurydice, uh, in part because of the hellish apocalyptic overtones of this project. Uh, the, the first poem I've written uh, is entitled Orpheus. The organism reads it, and in response, it writes a poem called Eurydice. This is the Xenotext. Orpheus. Any style of life is prim. O oh, stay, my lyre, with wily ploys, moan the riff, the riff of any tune aloud. Moan now my fate, in fate we rely. My myth now is the word, the word of life. Now the organism can read this poem, and in response it writes this poem, Nicknamed Eurydice. The fairy is rosy of glow. In fate we rely. Moan more grief with any loss. Any loss is the achy trick. With him we stay. Oh, stay, my liar. We wean him of any milk. Any milk is rosy. Now, as a footnote, I probably should note that uh, when the organism begins writing that poem, uh, it actually causes it to fluoresce red in the dark, so that it actually glows red, much like the fairy that it describes in the poem itself. And that's, in fact, how you know that the project is working. You simply have to look at the bacterium and see that it is fluorescing red. I'm going to uh, read to you uh, some excerpts uh, from uh, the greatest story about Orpheus and Eurydice, uh, book four of the Georgics by Virgil. Uh, this uh, section is entitled, uh, Colony Collapse Disorder. Exordium. European honeybees, Apis mellifera, have suffered from a pandemic syndrome that causes workers to forsake their duties, foraging without returning home, leaving the queen and her brood unattended until the hive itself dwindles into abandonment. 
Moreover, any stores of honey in the forsaken dwelling often go unlooted by other pests for much longer than expected. While entomologists have proposed several factors that might account for this disorder, including bouts of infection by either varroa mites or fungal smuts, the problem is likely aggravated by the broad usage of the pesticide imidacloprid, a neonicotinoid that can disrupt the nervous systems of bees, impairing their ability to navigate. The disorder threatens this species of insect with extinction, thus posing a danger to the welfare of humanity, which relies upon such bees to pollinate crops. On the armies of the realm. Orphaned at birth, the children enlisted in thy army learn the roster of chores fulfilled by the swarm, slaving together to build more hexagons for the barracks. When sprightly these militias fly skyward, marvel at their feral cloud, expanding and diffusing like smoke above a blaze. They seek fresh waters and leafy bowers, hence surrender unto them thy tributes, bestrewing hither the hints of sweetness, crumbly balsams and opulent hyssops, then let the zephyrs caress thy sleigh bells. The wind chimes of Sibylle, summoning all the bees to slumber in their cradles. Crusades, however, can spur the unrest of dormant legions, be stirred in the hive when rivalries arise between twin foes contending for ascendance to the throne. Notice from afar this call to slaughter, which must sway the fey mob of rioters, their fury a throb with pending warfare. Hearken to the brazen skirls that rebuke the latecomers unequipped for battle, each blast of the trumpet inciting them to muster their forces, to flex their wings, to knit their thews, rehoning each stinger to rally around the camp of their king and by their shouts defame all infidels. Lowlands in spring become a battlefield for these insurrectionists who surge forth from their fortress, igniting a skirmish whereby they commingle in a berserk cluster, a crazed vortex of multitudes more numerous than all the bits of hail falling like acorns shaken from an oak during a windstorm. Ornately shielded, the winged moguls barge into this melee, their pygmy hearts full of godly malice, each vowing to show his twin no mercy until some victor swats aside all blows. A fistful of dust thrown into this fray can quell the frenzy of such insurgents. Subpoena this pair of brawling kingpins from their arena, but condemn to death the Khan, more crippled by his injuries, lest he prove too hindersome to the hive. Then enthrone at once the better despot, the one with a golden helmet that shines. For twofold is his kin, the great hero who wags a killing sting, and the elder lord who lugs a swollen belly, all bees alike unto men, some crude, some noble, like the sun-cursed pilgrim in the desert, hating his downtroddenness in the dust, or the sun-graced esquire in the garden, loving the delightsomeness of his gold. Highborn are the dryads of this feudal father who in summer lets his maidens filter honey thin and pure like cognac, mellowing the muscatels of Bacchus. But if such ruckus makes thy dizzy serfs forego their tasks to frolic in the skies, all their forsaken pantries left unfilled, then extract the pinions of the patron, so that if unwinged he must malinger, his minions unwilling to move his flag. Let lees of fragrant saffrons lure the bees homeward, and put thy faith in Priapus, to safe keep the propolis with his scythe, fending off raids by martins and looters. on the plight of the swarm. Demigods grant the honeybees a share of the divine liquor, 
the mead that hath caused imbibers to dream of the ether which suffuses the empire of the stars, a chasm from which all mortals amass at birth each atom of their inner flame. Unto this abyss all souls are gathered to be torn asunder, scattered like soot in a gale. But upward into this vault of night fly tiny bees in mighty hordes. If thou durst unlatch their sarcophagi to drink from thy cup the floral syrup, dab thy lip with rose water by the tomb, then pry the lid amid a flood of smoke. Harvests of these nectaries by clansfolk occur twice in the quartet of seasons, once when the gazelle of the Pleiades uplifts her starlit antlers for bowyers to see, her footfall spraying the sea foam, and once when she flees pursuit by Pisces, dipping from the skies to sip from a sea so icy that the chill fills her with scorn. When bitten by their enemies, all bees can spit out venom through a tiny dart, leaving part of their spirit in the scar. If thou durst dread the perils of winter, thinking to temper such coming danger, let the trials of thy slaves prick thy heart. Fearless be thy servants who fumigate the hive with frankincense, excising wax, now pestilent, for lizards gnaw unseen into the comb, as insects cram unjust into each room, like rivals at thy feast. The vulgar beetle that spoils thy labor, thy brutal hornet that steals thy repast, the greedy locust that swills thy nectar, the savage spider damned by Minerva to weave a cobweb across each egress. When a bee feels such impoverishments, it strives more keenly to heal the ravished fortunes of its race, refilling these casks by ransacking daisies, without surcease. Doomsday wreaks its toll of ruination upon these helots, whose bodies languish and collapse under the lash of bondage. The afflicted, gray and lean with decay are borne away on beers by pall bearers, the ungrieving caretakers bred to clear the waxen cells, whilst survivors loiter, listless from famine, in these vestibules, each soul frostbitten by an early chill. Now hearken to the keening of the hive. Not a wind that sighs amid the aspens, nor a tide that booms upon the oceans, but more akin to some hellish bonfire trapped within the crucibles of its kiln. In kindle censers filled with laudanum, then lighten the beggardom of thy serfs by piping them molasses through a reed, exhorting each starveling to sip till full. Brew for them a liquor of oaken galls and dried roses, if not a wine quickened to a boil like a stew, the crushed raisins from Scythian vines infused with acrid resin made of knapweed and fever few. Hunt far in thy pastures for the starwort, a breed of aster dotting each hill crest, the lone seed upthrusting many a stem, its crown all gilt but girt with a muster of blades, a gleam in hues of amethyst. Garlands of these purple petals imbue thy altars with sense of bitter sweetness, and peasants tending sheep in a valley by the river Mela, gather these blooms to steep them in mulses of honeydew, left in an alms bowl beside each warren. But if thy legions die without warning, the beekeepers unable to spawn them anew, then let me divulge a woeful legend which can convey the arcanum taught to us by the swain Aristeus. How the bloodletting of a bull, if slain, gives birth to a swarm from the carrion. Let me unveil this omen of our doom. (laughs) 
on the lament of the lover. Mist, trust me not, for a sublime rancor hath seen fit to revile thee, blighting thee with reckonings unpardoned. Orpheus, the widower, hath inveighed against thee, whilst raving in vain for his taken bride, Eurydice. The nymph pursued by thee along the river bank, where, unbeknownst to her, death from the flick of an adder hath hid amongst the reeds to befall her. Glumly, hamadryads and mermaidens cry lamentations from the mountain tops of Pangaea and Rhodope, the heights from which the river Hebrus spills itself into deserts ruled by Rhesus of Thrace. Unsoothed by these lamenters, Orpheus hath cradled his lyre, alone by the shore, consoling his grief in hymns to his wife. Hence he throws himself into the crater of Mount Tenerum to seek the hellish citadels of Dis, immersed in darkness, where he confronts the Tritonic servants of a dreaded autark, whose agate heart no song can crack. The bard, nevertheless, hath spoken a sonnet that can summon from the depths of Erebus the phantoms of soldiers lost to the light, all of them rising like starlings that flee to the trees after scattering from the hills at dusk. Warriors slaughtered in wartime gather as spirits around him, each man a son burned upon the pyre before his father, each man bereft in a mire of black slime from the river Cocytus, its swampland filled with effluent from the river Styx. Even ghouls in the house of Tartarus stand still in amazement, just as vipers which hiss in headdresses for the furies fall silent. Even now the scabrous watchdog Kerberus ceases to growl as the wheel of Ixion halts. With his spell, the bard bypasses these threats, thereby rescuing Eurydice, who follows him homeward. Promised such freedom by Proserpina, the minstrel, however, breaks his bargain when insistent yearnings overcome him like some fever for which only phantoms might forgive him. And thus his arrival at the threshold of salvation leaves him heedless, his will so weak that he glances backward toward hell to allay his fear that Eurydice hath strayed, his concern thereby betraying the bonds of his spell. Hence the caverns of Avernus tremble. Orpheus cries his bride, what perfidy hast thou wreaked upon us? Alas, I feel myself recalled to fatal sleep. Farewell, shrouded, by a veil of mist, I outstretch my arms to thee. No longer am I thine. And thus she recedes into the fog drifts, sundered from his sight as he ravages the shadows, bewildered, vainly clutching for his bride. But Karan, the ferryman of Orcus, forbids him further passage. What can a poet do, now twice riven, what cries, what pleas can evoke the pity of the morbid demons in this dungeon? For his lover sleeps, frozen and adrift, upon her Stygian barge, whilst he weeps beneath the somber cliffs near the river Strymon, taming the lions with his sighs. Mournful, the nightingale in the alder bewails the loss of her nestlings, lifted whilst unfledged by a pitiless woodsman. So she laments her nightlong sorrowing, trilling her sadness in constant refrains till the valley overflows with her strife. Likewise, Orpheus broods on misfortune, wandering heartbroken in the northern ice field of Tanais, the snowbound fort on the steps of Ripea, bemoaning his deprivation, his vain boon from Dis. All the Ismaran witches, scorned by him during the foreplay of their bacchanals, carve him apart, discarding his entrails. Beheaded, and bestrewn across the fields. His dismembered body can find no rest, for his skull floats in the river Hebrus, 
whispering whilst rolling in the eddies, gasping out one sworn theme. Eurydice, Eurydice. Each mournful susurrus echoing from the shoreline of the stream. Eurydice. Whereupon the sea god Proteus stirs himself from his daydream to break loose from his captor by lunging into the turbid depths of a whirlpool, plunging downward until he vanishes. Carini then steps forth to soothe her son, declaring, Banish from thy soul all care. I'm going to read to you now um, uh, a short poem that is, in fact, the very first love poem I've ever written for another woman. I'm nearly 50 years old, and in my entire poetic career, I've never written a love poem for somebody, and this happens to be it. Uh, it is entitled The Nocturne of Orpheus. For the maiden in her dark, pale meadow on nights when I have fears that I may cease to be. Uh, this poem was actually written according to a, a variety of really difficult constraints. It took me five months to write this poem. It is not going to sound like it took me five months to write it, but uh, it took me a very long time to work on it almost exclusively. And you have to imagine these words being spoken by Orpheus at the very threshold of hell before he finally crosses uh, through the gates of death. The Nocturne of Orpheus. This covenant of love in a dirge for a god has delighted an angel who obeys my plea. Each sonnet a rhythm for her to decipher, making legible a key in her dream of dusk. A redness that darkens the hue of a tulip is richening her view on the hill of a lee, dappling her vista at the end of my vigil, even if havoc calls forth ruin to kill me. No church, no chapel is a refuge in a storm. If we beg to be warm, yet let die the candle. No herder, no hermit, enchanted by the sea, has hitherto known the ennui of a coward, even when infernos in hell burn the hero. Radiant as flint be the ache of my sorrow. Epilogue. Virgil greets us at the gates of death to tell us that we love our lovers, but never enough to bring them back from hell. How can we apologize for our desire when our lust for life gives birth to murder? How can we regain the favor of the gods when we discover that as penance for our crime against true love, we have damned our children to leave the fallout shelter. How can our poetic patron, a heroic leader of the empire, earn forgiveness for sending all his soldiers to the grievous abattoir of warfare, plowing them like salt into our pasture? How do we expiate our sins after having already sacrificed every beast upon every altar? How do we absolve ourselves for having caused our own extinction. Be it known that the fruit upon the tree of Eden is a beehive leaking out black honey made by bees that feed upon the infernal blossoms of the underworld. And uh, finally, I'd just like to perform for you this last poem entitled The Xenagogue. The poet hammers upon the grim gate of dis to demand of demons one night of rest, the right of each pilgrim to wait like a guest greeted by death at twilight. The poet begs to exhume the frail ghost of his lost muse, bewailing her demise, his plea testing the goodwill of his host, for a beggar might be Zeus in disguise. The poet forsakes every word in trade for such favor, but like pollen fallen upon a pale rose forlorn in the shade, 
His cantos bring scant life to her garden. She listens, but the lament that he sings dissolves in the cells of all living things. Thank you one and all for indulging me. I appreciate uh, your graciousness. Uh, I'm told now that uh, if you'd like, I can actually respond to any questions or perhaps concerns uh, that you might have about uh, this particular uh, performance or this particular project. So first, I think we should certainly thank Christian for coming and reading for us. Thank you. Thank you. It, it is that moment, it's like the end of uh, the Talking Heads concert film, Stop Making Sense, when David Byrne says, any questions? Um, so, it, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm curious if you might, uh, or would you tell us something about the constraints of your love poem? Uh, about the constraints of the love poem. Um, it's uh, an Alexandrine sonnet. Uh, all that means is that it has 12 syllables per line. It's written according to uh, the standard constraints of a sonnet. It's a blank sonnet uh, with internal rhyme, musical cadences, as you've heard. The dedication uh, for the maiden in her dark pale meadow, that dedication appears as an acrostic. The first letters of each line spell out the maiden in her, and the last letters, the terminal letters of each line, spell out uh, dark pale meadow. So the dedication is actually ensconced in this double acrostic structure through the initial letters and terminal letters of each line. It's a standard Victorian way of um, dedicating a love poem to somebody. To emphasize this double acrostic structure, every single line has exactly 33 letters uh, and is thus written according to a grid that aligns these letters perfectly. Now, none of this is very difficult. Um, my romantic partner's uh, favorite poem is this extraordinary sonnet called When I Have Fears That I May Cease to Be, a meditation by John Keats on his own mortality. It's one of the most beautiful sonnets in the English language. It's an extraordinary poem written by a young poet knowing he is going to die and never know true love or fame. Uh, so this poem I've written, this beautiful sonnet, is an Alexandrine sonnet with 12 syllables per line, 33 letters per line, with a dedication embedded in a double acrostic structure. And the poem itself is a perfect anagram of the sonnet, When I Have Fears That I May Cease to Be by John Keats. Every single letter in that poem is simply rearranged to conform to this particular structure. That's why it took me five months. Uh, it's nothing to, to build an anagram of another poem. It's really nothing to build a double acrostic sonnet. But to try and do these two things simultaneously is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, so she appreciated the poem, thankfully. I was very grateful that uh, th 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 those months of uh, work were not in vain. So that's the answer to the question. I apologize for its ver verbosity, but it's, a, it's somewhat complex. I should note that every single poem in the book really does have a lengthy explanation attached to it, all of which are uh, charitably provided at the end of the book. Any other questions? Please feel free to... Uh... So do you actually have any of this bacterium, and how did you make it? I've managed to get the project to work uh, properly and definitively in uh, a sample colony of E. coli. I, I did this uh, several years ago uh, in an effort to uh, demonstrate uh, proof of the concept so that I'd be able to then uh, gain permission to work on the extremophile bacterium. I had to be able to demonstrate that I had sufficient uh, aptitude to engineer um, a well-understood organism. Uh, the extremophile is much more difficult to engineer, and there isn't as much expertise in the world uh, that I can call upon to help me with it. Moreover, uh, uh, it's expensive to uh, conduct any of these uh, assays. Uh, it took me uh, several years uh, uh, of work. Uh, kept failing in E. coli, and I finally got it to work. I wish I had uh, stopped there and said, I've, you know, the first poet in history ever to get a bacterium not only to store a poem, but write one in response, um, uh, because then I, I would get to be probably one of the most famous poets of my generation. And as it stands right now, I'm maybe in the top five. Um, uh, the outcome of the experiment right now is uh, uh, in flux because I need to hit three benchmarks of success. Uh, I have to uh, demonstrate that the genetic sequence is properly integrated into the chromosome of the bacterium. Uh, we have to see the organism fluoresce, meaning, of course, that it is, in fact, responding to the genetic sequence and building the protein. 
and then we have to verify that the entire mass of the protein is there stably enough for us to be able to characterize uh, its sequence of amino acids. So that in fact, you can read the poem. Um, on my very last uh, attempt to do this, before I ran out of money and my contracts expired, uh, the scientists thought they were giving me good news because uh, they could tell that uh, the sequence was properly integrated into the chromosome and the organism was fluorescing. But they couldn't detect the entire mass of the protein. And this was bad news to me. They knew it was making it. They just said, it, it's not all there. We can't detect all of it. It's probably metabolizing it too quickly. Uh, I said, what if it's censoring it? What if it's, in fact, uh, you know, not uh, uh, producing the entire protein? It's you know, ribosomally stopping because it, it's choking on, on this act. But for whatever reason, it's not making the entire protein. And in this respect, it's like sending a text straight to the shredder without having an opportunity to, uh, to read it. Right? I'm sending it straight from the fax to the shredder. Um, the uh, uh, fallout of that, of course, is that instead of having created the world's first unkillable poet, I've created the world's first unkillable critic. <laughs> it's not exactly my, uh, my intention. And uh, I've, uh, I'm in the process now of having to rebuild uh, my resources so that I can try again. I don't have a very good hypothesis, though, for why it failed. Uh, I merely transported the successful construct from E. coli, uh, adapted the... Uh, codon biases for the extremophile and then just uh, implanted it on the assumption that this new construct would be sufficiently stable for us to detect the resulting protein. But for whatever reason, it's, uh, it's not building it properly. And I don't know why, and neither do my <laughs> consulting scientists. So I have to come up with a, a better hypothesis uh, so that I can um, uh, produce a new assay. It normally takes about six months to design the gene sequence, verify its uh, uh, likely protein fold through supercomputation. Uh, you know, work on uh, uh, getting it created and then testing it out on an organism. It takes, it takes a while. And it costs, you know, uh, $10,000 typically. So that's a lot of money and it's a lot of wasted time if it doesn't work. Uh, so I've, I've got to make sure that I've got a credible uh, result for the next time I try it. Anything else? I saw that Eric at the back, huh? I was curious. Here you go. Use this. What is the encoding between DNA in the first poem and the, and the protein sequence in the produced poem? OK. Um, the two poems are written according to a really difficult constraint. Uh, there's, of course, a, a biochemical correlation between any given genetic sequence and its resulting amino sequence of amino acids. There's a, a biochemically uh, foreordained relationship between those two uh, molecular sequences. and um, I've done my best to uh, characterize the relationship between the two poems themselves according to this biochemical set of constraints. Um, I try to explain it metaphorically by pointing to uh, cryptograms in Sunday newspapers where you're given a message that makes no sense. Uh, but if you analyze its letter patterns and letter frequencies uh, and use uh, some uh, logic and heuristics, you can uh, decipher the message into a meaningful sentence. And as a kid deciphering these uh, cryptograms, I used to wonder why the designer of these puzzles did not present to us a cryptogram that was, in fact, a meaningful sentence. He gave us a meaningful sentence. And then through an analysis of its letter patterns and letter frequencies and with the use of logic and heuristics, we could then decipher it into yet another meaningful sentence. So the encrypted sentence actually looks like a meaningful message. And that would certainly be the perfect disguise for, the, for, the, for your uh, secret message, because the sent message would look meaningful. It wouldn't look like it's, in fact, uh, enciphered. So you might miss it. I now understand why puzzle designers do not do this particular constraint. It's extremely difficult. Um, imagine pairing off uh, all the letters of the alphabet so they're mutually encoded. So if you assign A to N, you have to assign N to A. If you assign D to T, you have to assign T to D or something like that. Let's, let's pair off all the letters so that they're mutually enciphered with each other. There's about 8 trillion different ways of doing that. So pick one of those ciphers out of the eight trillion, uh, according to some rules of thumb and heuristics that you think might work. Pick one of these eight trillion ciphers. Now write a poem that's beautiful and makes sense in such a way that if you were to swap out every letter in your poem and replace it with its cognate from your cipher, you produce a new text that's still just as beautiful and still makes sense. Those two poems I read to you are written according to that constraint. So for example, wherever you might see the letter A in one poem, you will see T in the other, and vice versa. 
Wherever the letter N appears in one poem, you'll see H in the other, and vice versa. Wherever the letter E appears in one poem, the letter Y appears in the other, and vice versa. They're, they're mutually transposable texts written according to this constraint. Um, I uh, built software that would permit me to explore these eight trillion ciphers and generate lexicons from the English language so that I could figure out what it might be possible to say. And most of these lexicons I came up with uh, were incapable of producing two syntactically meaningful sentences that could mutually encipher each other. And as a consequence, I spent four years writing those two little poems. I did nothing else for four years. I wrote only those two poems. I worked on these two poems for four years, trying to find them among those eight trillion opportunities. And uh, you know, my most uh, vast uh, repertoire of words was about 780 words. And I would start whittling away at vocabularies, working through ones that were shorter and shorter. It's fewer and fewer words, until I was bound down to about uh, vocabularies that had only 120 words. And I was getting very concerned that I could not find uh, a suitable lexicon that would permit me to transpose uh, two meaningful texts that would be self-reflexive and say something meaningful. Uh, I still had not yet produced even two meaningful phrases or sentences that could refer to each other. And what I've learned from this is that of the eight trillion ciphers, only one is capable of poetry. There are eight trillion universes that I could have chosen, and only one is capable of supporting life. And to me, that's what makes these two poems special. They're not necessarily the kinds of poems I would typically write, as you might have tell, told from my, the rest of my reading, but uh, they're the only ones, I think, that could have been written at all, according to these constraints. So that's how they've been written. That's the, that's the process of encoding that, that has gone into it. Any other questions? Please don't be shy. Last chance. Anyone else? Anyone else? Oh, we got another oh, mic. What's your next project? I have no clue. Uh, I'm still not done this one. I've got, uh, this is just the first book. I've got uh, another book to write that's uh, part of this uh, project. I've got to figure out how to solve the problem with um, the uh, engineering of the organism, and uh, that will probably take up my time for the next uh, year or two at least. Um, I don't foresee working on another book until this one's done. Um, I've been I'm working on this entire project now for 15 years. Uh, and I'm still not at the end, and I still don't even know if it's, if it's possible to do it. That's, that's the major concern. I still don't know if I can actually pull it off, uh, whether or not the, the constraints are too onerous uh, for the organism to respond viably to, the, to these um, attempts to manipulate it. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of like an old god, right? I'm trying to appease a god, uh, you know, sacrificing all of this time, lucre, energy, you know, to it uh, in an effort to show my worthiness, I suppose in the hope that it'll uh, finally relent and actually uh, do my bidding. So I don't have, a, unfortunately, another project after this. I haven't really thought about it. I've got a few Chevys, you know, you know on the blocks in the backyard, right? But n none of them are <laughs> going to be uh, roadworthy for a while. I'm just, whoa. <laughs> I'm curious about why you wanted to do this. My last book, uh, Unoya, the book for which I'm probably most famous. Um, you know I spelled E-U-N-O-I-A. It is the shortest word in English to contain all the vowels. And the word quite literally means beautiful thinking. The word was coined by Aristotle to describe uh, the state of mind that you have to be in if you want to make a friend. You have to be in a state of good will, in a state of beautiful thinking. And uh, I thought this is a beautiful metaphor for poetry. And I wrote a book uh, that consists of five chapters, each of which tells a story but does so using only one of the five vowels. So in the first chapter, I can only use words that have A as their only vowel. I can only use words like abracadabra, banana, mat, cat, bat. And I tell perfectly intelligible stories that are unbelabored, sound effortless, uh, that are musically appealing, and uh, when read aloud, uh, just sound like ordinary speech. But they're written according to these constraints. First chapter only contains A, second chapter only contains E, etc. Uh, this book went on to enjoy a tremendous amount of uh, renown around the world. It became the first uh, book of poetry of its kind to uh, become a bestseller in Canada. It's the first bestseller in Canadian history. Uh, it won the most lucrative prize in the world that you can win uh, for poetry, short of the Nobel Prize, and uh, uh, garnered my international reputation as a poet. So I felt that after that work that I might have permission to do something even crazier, even weirder than that last project. 
And I read an article uh, in a computer science magazine, an article by Pak Chung Wong and his team of uh, computer scientists, in which they uh, enciphered the lyrics to It's a Small World After All into the genome of a, an extremophile, our very hardy bacterium, in order to demonstrate that it was possible to store information for later retrieval in the event of planetary disasters like meteor impacts or atomic warfare. We might be able to reconstitute our culture after such a disaster by uh, reading the genomes of these uh, super surviving organisms. At the same time, I also read a, a, an article in The New Scientist uh, by the astrophysicist uh, Paul Davies, uh, who speculated that our search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, through radio beacons might be misguided, that uh, it's probably too expensive to maintain a radio beacon over millennia uh, broadcasting uh, uh, throughout uh, the uh, galaxy. Moreover, uh, UFO sightings notwithstanding, it's probably impossible really to send uh, interstellar spacecraft across these distances to communicate with civilizations. Uh, most scientists uh, since the 1950s have pretty much uh, s speculated that if we encounter aliens, we're almost certainly going to encounter their robotic emissaries. We're just going to encounter probes and most likely uh, uh, self-replicating machines that are capable of using resources in the various uh, solar systems that they encounter to rebuild copies of themselves that are then projected into the void and uh, through um, the miracle of um, exponential reproduction uh, colonize the galaxy in a few million years. Um, they just have to sit and wait uh, for a sufficiently smart civilization then to discover them uh, s sitting in their solar system somewhere. Well, Paul Davies said such self-replicating machines already exist and they're called spores and viruses, living things like bacteria. And he speculated that perhaps uh, an alien civilization might, in fact, encode information into the genomes of organisms and then send these spores or viruses into the void uh, such that they could then uh, uh, colonize the various ecosystems that they encounter uh, during their uh, journeys from star to star and integrate themselves into the various ecologies that they find uh, sitting and waiting for a sufficiently smart civilization with fast enough computers and bright enough cryptographers to find these messages. And he thought that after having done a survey, perhaps, of all the genomes of every organism on this planet, some lucky graduate student might have the good fortune of perhaps finding an encoded message from outer space embedded in one of them. So I took these two extravagant speculations. These are both you know, extravagant speculations and said, well, hey, we are already one of those civilizations that has the technical capacity to build such machines that we could then project into the void. And why not be that civilization right now? And certainly poetry should be in the ground floor of such a, uh, an exercise. Surely poetry should participate in this kind of activity. I mean, you, you don't really want the first uh, messages enciphered in organisms to be uh, slogans for Microsoft, right? Uh, I think that you, you know, it, it, on the one hand, uh, you know, the invention of the light bulb, I suppose, you know, uh, uh, lights up Ferris wheels at night, but at the same time, it also produced the night shift. Uh, at work, and I would like to think that surely we can manipulate these uh, technologies uh, to um, beautiful purposes, not just simply utilitarian purposes. And hence, that's why I did this project. Uh, it, uh, no other poets were doing anything like this. I thought this terrain is all mine, and uh, I'm doing it in part to scare friends and rivals, right, to make their lives miserable. Like if I pull this off, most of my poet friends are really going to have a very difficult time being poets afterwards. Right? Uh, so you know that's why I'm doing it. Yes. Um, <laughs> if it doesn't work out, will you be? How would how would you feel? Would you? I, I'm not going to feel very good about that if I if I can't get it to work. But I should note that my friends are very excited if it fails. Uh, they all want to argue that uh, failure is more interesting than success. That if it fails, it will be a lot more interesting, right? That that I've not been able to manipulate the organism to my ends. And I always say that failure is always way more interesting to the spectators. Right, never to the athlete uh, in, in the arena. I mean, when that ski jumper in you know, wild, well, great wild world of sports, you know, CBC wild, wide world of sports, when that ski jumper goes off the edge of the ski jump and then completely wipes out at the end, right? You got this yard sale of you know, broken body parts at the end. Um, I, I don't think failure was very interesting to him at that moment, okay? But it was really interesting to us, right? And uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, failure is uh, presumed among poets. Uh, poets fail. Right. We all, we're, we're losers in some respects, right? You know, we're incapable of success. In fact, success does not sit very well with many poets. 
And I want to be a poet who succeeds. I do not want to have to be a poet who uh, is satisfied with failing and has to somehow retrofit failure into a kind of pale success. That's not what I'm about. Uh, so I, I, the reason I've, I've been so dedicated to the work, despite uh, the many obstacles and despite the difficulty of most of these um, stages, every phase has proven to be Herculean in its effort. Um, I, I'd still like to see such an object exist. I'd really like to see such a book written. You know, I'm the kind of poet uh, who writes books like this because um, nobody else is writing them for me, and I want to see this book in the world. So I'm, I'm hoping that I, I, can, I can do this simply so that uh, I can sh grant permission, I think, to my other peers to be no less ambitious in their own projects. I mean, poets really do, I think, uh, you know, suffer from chronic laziness and, you know, we're all ne'er-do-wells, right? right? I mean, being a poet is, you know, one of the best jobs. I will say it is one of the best jobs because you do get to work indoors and you can drink on the job. <laughs> There's, there's not a lot of jobs where you can do that, right? You know, m maybe a brain surgeon or an air traffic controller, right? Uh, there's not a lot. Uh, so it, uh, there's lots, lots of benefits to, to, to being such a poet, but I, I think the worst part, worst part of the job is, is constantly failing. What would you say is like a unifying theme in Zeno text, I guess? Well, uh, I think the book uh, and the project has a lot of variant themes. It has all kinds of different uh, things about it. I mean, the book is kind of really riven with hell and heartbreak. There's a, an oracular, apocalyptic tone to the whole project. Uh, I, I look at this work and, f and think of it as the most melancholy thing I've ever really written. Most of the other works are more playful and wistful in their poetics, but this one is um, a lot sadder and darker in tone. And uh, it owes a, a debt, I guess, to Virgil and Milton. It's got that kind of uh, epic grandeur uh, in its tone. And uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's concerned with uh, the extinction of the human species. I think uh, it would be sad for humanity to disappear from the face of the earth because so far as we know, we're the only sentient culture ever to exist in the history of the universe. And, uh, 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 you know, we're, we're uh, certainly putting ourselves uh, under threat. Um, I, I'm also optimistic, though, that we, we will be able to weather or prevent um, the worst of uh, our uh, uh, ecological collapse. Uh, I think that we probably have the power to do that, and certainly you know, uh, engineers and scientists working here at MIT uh, will undoubtedly be thanked prolif prolifically in the future for their hard work uh, saving the planet. Uh, these, these poems are, are, I guess, meditations uh, you know, on, those, on the prospects of of our own demise, and certainly thinking about how we can preserve our own cultural legacy against planetary disaster. I think it's probably an ethical concern that we should uh, preserve uh, something of our culture um, uh, beyond our you know, perceived uh, existence. I think it's important for us to be able to testify to our presence upon the planet. As it stands right now, we project into the future only three uh, long-lasting legacies. Everything you see around you will be, of course, uh, ground down into uh, a very virtually undetectable layer of dust in the geological record. And the only things that uh, might persist as evidence of our presence upon the planet uh, of hundreds of millions of years from now include uh, our radioactive waste. Uh, a civilization from outer space might come to the planet Earth and of course see that the background radiation from our radioactive waste uh, exceeds uh, the geological norms for this particular planet. Uh, they would also, of course, note that uh, the fossil record uh, would encode uh, uh, the sixth mass extinction that we're currently causing, and there won't be an associated astrophysical phenomenon uh, associated with that disaster. And then finally, of course, all of the uh, environmental effects and uh, geological record of our uh, uh, disruption of climate through global warming, all of that will be preserved in the fossil record. I don't think that these are really great legacies to bequeath the future. Uh, three kinds of pollution, three kinds of uh, negligence. Um, I think it's much better that we've got something like the Voyager probes, uh, you know, out in the interstellar void with some of the most beautiful aspects of our culture preserved uh, uh, against uh, uh, our own destruction. Certainly, uh, you know, s the, the um, few uh, relics that have been, you know, bolted to the sides of satellites uh, archived in the Clark Belt, they'll outlast uh, us for sure, and they'll probably testify to our presence upon the planet, but on the Earth itself, there's not many legacies that we leave to the future that really matter. 
Thank you for that question. There's another one here in the middle. I was going to ask if you have a large support team, a uh, team of apprentices or funding sources to... Uh, uh, I've, I've spent so far um, about $175,000 of um, taxpayer money in Canada, uh, garnered from a wide variety of sources. Um, my uh, team has usually never, uh, has, is, is often never, often never, it's, it, it's often only a few people, usually three or two or three at a time. Um, I've had to uh, build expertise to handle specific uh, concerns or tasks, and then once that task is done, then I have to uh, rebuild new expertise for the subsequent uh, task. I've collaborated with lots of laboratories around the world. Uh, I've certainly worked uh, with um, uh, the bioscience um, uh, research labs at my own institution, uh, a laboratory at the University of Wyoming, uh, laboratory in um, uh, Silicon Valley. A uh, handful of uh, other smaller uh, commercial providers have assisted me with uh, uh, tasks. And in each of these cases, uh, I'm responsible, of course, for designing and troubleshooting the, uh, the construct. Um, I have to do all the genetic engineering myself. I have to do all the proteomic engineering myself. And I have to do all the research myself. Uh, scientists won't help me with any of that stuff. Uh, the scientists and technicians that I, I've called upon will, of course, uh, make things for me, and they'll test things for me. But they don't troubleshoot any of this. Uh, I have to do it all myself. And uh, they don't do any of the research for me. I have to do that all myself. Um, they don't de dedicate much uh, uh, time or resources unless I can pay them to do so. Right? I don't get a lot of donated uh, expertise. Um, I've certainly, uh, you know, uh, had lots of uh, consultations with uh, experts uh, from all around the world, individuals whom I've relied upon to uh, give me insights into shortcomings with the construct or um, uh, changes that I might be able to make to it. Uh, you know, occasionally I can get a hypothesis that I can test, but uh, mostly uh, it's me working by myself on those, except on those occasions when I might need, need something made or tested. You've all been very gracious. Is there any other questions? Well, let me just ask Christian if you'd read the uh, uh, sonnet again for us to conclude. You want to hear that sonnet again? I, I do. You want to hear that again? Will I that be boring for you if I do that again? Just read, read one more time for you? <laughs> they can leave if they want okay. to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The Nocturne of Orpheus. For the maiden in her dark pale meadow on nights when I have fears that I may cease to be. This covenant of love in a dirge for a god has delighted an angel who obeys my plea. Each sonnet a rhythm for her to decipher, making legible a key in her dream of dusk. A redness that darkens the hue of a tulip is richening her view on the hill of a lee, dappling her vista at the end of my vigil, even if havoc calls forth ruin to kill me. No church, no chapel is a refuge in a storm if we beg to be warm, yet let die the candle. No herder, no hermit, enchanted by the sea, has hitherto known the ennui of a coward, even when infernos in hell burn the hero, radiant as flint be the ache of my sorrow. Thank you one and all for coming out. Uh, please, I hope you'll buy some books. Uh, I'll stick around and sign some. And thanks again for your graciousness. I appreciate it.